useful? Okay. Let me uh, tell you a story first. I guess it's about power, coveting power, and what happens once you have it. And then we'll make it a bit more personal. There was this king, or a mayor of a city, and his best judge passed away, and he was looking for a judge who was just and fair and honest and decent. So he sends out word, you know, that I'm going to be sending two of my trusted friends looking for Hello, Mayla. Hello, Diana. Uh, looking for a relatively just jurist. So this particular man whose name is Mullah Nasruddin hears of this news and waits for these people to show up. And eventually they do. So he wears his best outfit, three-piece suit worth about 20,000 bucks. And he has this old fishing net. It's a very strange thing. You have this brand new suit on worth so much money. And you have this old stinky fishing net on your shoulder. And so he runs into these two folks. And they're kind of puzzled. You know, you're wearing a Gucci outfit and you have this old smelly fishing net on your shoulder. What's up with that? And he says, it's to remind me of my humble beginning. And they say, what do you mean? He says, well, I was a fisherman. I was very poor. Life was tough. Money was tight. But Jesus sat on my boat, went like this, and all this fish appeared. And I became prosperous. And I knew that power and money and fame can corrupt you, make you forget and make you become cruel like Gilgamesh. So I have this fishing net on my shoulder every single day to remind me of my humble beginnings. It will counter the arrogance and the greed that comes with power. And so these two people say, wow, what a good man this guy is. So he gets the job. He has, you know, like one of those Supreme Court justices, lifetime. And so they run into him the following week. He still has this three-piece suit on, but there is no fishing net. And they ask him, where's the net? And he says, what use is there for the net once the fish has been caught? He was fishing for the job. He got the job. Now that he has the job, there is no need for the net. But let me... Do this differently. And forgive me for making it personal. That's just the way I do business. I was shipped to India because I was such a bad student at school. Then I was shipped to US because I was such a bad student in India. Then a couple times my mom went to the hospital because of the sort of stress I put on her. I eventually walked away from school, which is for an immigrant, Persian, you come here to go to school and you look at your parents and you say, no, I don't want to go to school. It's not interesting. I had zero power. I had become this a source of embarrassment and shame for my parents, my brother, I graduated, I had graduated, I mean, my sister had, but I was nothing. I had zero power. And when you have zero power, you have no value. No one pays you attention. You know, my own teacher, Hussein, would always say, if I had a PhD after my name, people would listen to me. But he had a Persian mini mart. He would sell ice cream and bread and cups and, you know, those things. <sighs> 
And then, of course, I found my passion, which was philosophy. And for the first time, I went to school, took it seriously, took my passion for philosophy seriously, not the classes I was taking. And then, because Persians, you know, enjoy conversations about politics and religion, at once a very poor, ignorant kid had now read some books. Now, in every conversation, I would participate. And Hussein had commanded that I memorize the entire four Gospels. And so when I went to the shop, he would say, like, Mark 4, 5. And I had to just tell it to him by memory. And so when we had gatherings and people would start talking about religion, I would just quote, you know, and people, would, wow, what is that? You know, and I was a kid. And then this shy, reserved kid became no longer shy and profoundly arrogant. And eventually this kid got a job teaching or being in a classroom. Now, the truth is, no one in this class can compete with me. I mean, I've spent my entire life since I was 11 reading, you know, and the past maybe 35, 45, 40 years of my life thinking about things. Anyone whose hand goes up and says, well, the Bible this and the Quran that, it doesn't take me very much to put them out. Okay. With power comes attention. Where do you go three nights a week, Jordan, where people sit at your feet and listen to you? They don't have to like you, but you have their future in your hand. You can give them Fs, Ds, C's, B's, or A's. If someone doesn't like you, they'll just look at you and say, I don't like you. Who can say that to me? There are serious consequences. And like any other human being, you know, there is stress in life. It gets built up. You have thoughts. And somehow you need to use the bathroom because these are things that you eat, emotions. Experiences create emotions, create thoughts. And if they get stuck inside you, you just, you know, suffocate. So I come to class and I talk about them. It's not the Bible. I don't care about the Bible or Plato. These are my stuff. Where do you go? to vent, to empty yourself, to use other people, their ears, their time, their energy. And they look at you, they take notes. They raise your hand and they ask questions as if you know a thing or two. That's a tremendous amount of power. Now, so remember, uh, no one starts out with being powerful, all of us are weak, little by little, you know, it builds up. Now, depending on your background, depending on your history, depending on how much life has beaten you and what you've learned from all the times you've fallen and crumbled, you'll either become more angry, more resentful, which makes you a bit more cruel, which more arrogant towards people, or, um, you know, Kind of like the man with the fishing net. I, mean, I remember what it means to be a student, and I remember what it means to be 18 and to be confused. I know how it feels to sit in a classroom that you don't really like for about two, three, four, five hours. And you do your best writing essays about ideas you don't really care about. You're not interested. You know. Um, so there is also the temperamental aspect of it, that there are certain temperaments that regardless of how powerful they get, uh, or they become, that particular temperament has a tendency of just beating them down. Introverts are really good at that, you know. Uh, Jesus could never bring himself to kill anyone, but Moses could. I mean, temperamentally, they were just different. Uh, the power that Jesus had was being passive. The power that Moses had was an eye for an eye, you know. And of course, hello. History deals with these people differently.
so it's very intoxicating, power is. Especially if power comes with a bit of charisma and magnetism, then uh, well, you should, you should, you know, have a lot of power. Go to school, make lots of money, be the prodigal son. Go out there, spend whatever you have. And eventually life will teach you a couple of lessons, you know. So it's, it's one of those sad things about Ronald Reagan, who was to some extent the first terrorist. Um, you know, you would think that when Reagan eventually walked away from the presidency and he got a little older, that it happens to all of us. You know, as you age and as you get older and sicker and you're closer to death, you kind of sit back and reflect on all the things you have done. And you don't have to, you know, shout it out, but maybe you can just whisper it to yourself. Maybe I shouldn't have, you know, sent arms to Iran or this or that. But luckily for him, and I suppose tragic for us, hello, is that he suffered from Alzheimer's. He just forgot. And once you forget the history, there is no shame, there is no regret, there is no remorse, there is no repentance. You just forget, you know. So the one chance that a human being has to kind of reflect, evaluate, maybe have some emotions that have the power to baptize one's interior, you know, um, he didn't have. I don't know if I've answered your question the right way, but that's the best I can do. But we like people who have power. I've, I've shared the story with you in the past that they did an experiment that there were four elephants. One was given a pink bucket of water and the others were clear. It was just water, just different color. And so the three elephants who were just drinking clear water kind of stopped drinking and looked at this other elephant with this, you know, colorful uh, liquid. And they began to follow him around. There is something about us that enjoys being around those who are powerful. And when it comes to people like Malcolm or Gandhi or Jesus Christ or the Buddha, it's a very strange thing. Because the sort of philosophy that they express is quite dark. You know, there is, there is nothing uplifting about the teachings of Jesus. It's really quite sad. Because he doesn't value anything down here. No marriage, no kids, no money, no cars, no houses, nothing. This place is the, you know, a place where things just rush grow old and just die, you know. And yet there is something very powerful about him and the message that despite the fact that he weakens us through his philosophy, he also empowers us by kind of, you know, pushing some clarity into our thick skulls. So power comes in a variety of different ways. Uh, I don't know if you have seen the new image of Jesus Christ, Anthropologists, you know, and sociologists uh, went back in time and they said, okay, you know, if you're talking about the Middle East, <clears throat> this particular spot in the Middle East, what sort of people does this particular spot create? Are they blonde, blue eye? Do they look, you know, more like me? And so they put all these different components together and you should look at the image uh, that came out about maybe five, six years ago. He's a profoundly unattractive man. I mean, far more unattractive than Socrates. I mean, the story about Socrates is that someone ran into him in a pitch dark street and he looked like a monster, so they ran away. And it's dark, you can't see, and yet, you know, his ugliness just comes forth. Jesus is a thousand times more unattractive than him. You know, and yet you have to ask, you know, why is it that someone who's so unattractive to the senses can all of a sudden become so powerfully attractive to perhaps a different sense that we don't have access to. So, yeah. 
Um, it's always good to walk away from walk away from money when you have it. You know, don't don't be like uh, the fox in the sour grape story by Aesop. For those of you who may not know the story, it's about this fox who loves grapes, loves grapes. So by chance, he's walking to a tattoo shop um, and <laughs> sees all these grapes. But there is a fence, you know, so he puts his hand in there and he tries for the next like two, three, four, five hours. But um, he can't. And eventually frustration comes about and he says, ah, the grapes are probably too sour. You know, it was my fate not to reach them, not to grab them, not to eat them. So some people try to get some power. Eventually they realize they can't, you know, they're not qualified, that it's whatever the case may be. And so they just chalk it up to, to the fates. Maybe the gods just don't want me to be rich. And so from that point on, they condemn anyone who has money. It's always best to have lots of money, like Moses, and then walk away from it. Those are the best kind of people you can run into. Yeah. That's why the Buddha is so good. Not Jesus, Buddha, or Moses. You know, not even Moses. He's no good. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, Nina. What do you think is innate about attractiveness? I'm sorry? What do you think is innate about attractiveness? Like, it's changed so much. Um, When you look at um, sculpture, going back all the way to ancient Egypt and how it progressed and it reached its zenith, its golden age um, in the Greek era. So what you have in the ancient Greek, ancient Egypt is that uh, you have this like stick with two arms and two legs and a funny looking face. And there is nothing really attractive about it, but it's a piece of art. And should you find it, it will fetch you millions. But there was something very interesting about the Greeks, which was for some strange reason, they were looking and searching for perfection. Not perfection up there, but perfection down here. They were very secular, very physical. And so the temples they built, uh, some of the structures that they had built, uh, philosophies that they generated, and ultimately the sort of sculpture. And the best known uh, statue that they have is Boy Christos. And you should compare Egypt and Greece, and you'll find that this particular character, when it came to the Greek world, face is chiseled, you know, you have a beautiful jaw, you have high cheekbones, then you have biceps and thighs that are beautiful, then you have six pack, and just the way he's standing, you know. And so beauty, at least in terms of sculpture, has evolved, you know. Now in terms of human characters, you know, what you and I worship, our heroes, that also depends on the culture from which you come. Um, since many parts of Africa suffered hardship, what for them perhaps is the embodiment of perfection and beauty and attractiveness is Nelson Mandela or Bishop Tutu. Okay. Now, when you come to America, which is a land of privilege, you know, uh, and to some extent, being young, our heroes have changed, you know, from, say, some of the heroes that this culture has created to Kanye West, even though he's gone a little crazy, uh, Taylor Swift, Miley Cyrus, Snoop Dogg. And so, for the most part, the culture creates what people should gravitate towards. Um, unless, again, you happen to be a very reflective human being like a Plato, like a Jordan Peterson where you don't look so much for the outside, but what people have on the inside or substance. Uh, but regardless, there is something about us, all of us in this class. You may not like Taylor Swift, but when I suppose her image is on the screen, you kind of just become a bit curious. 
Um, I think if you were to look at, let's just say you're a heterosexual young woman, let's say that the idea of attraction is something you want to have a relationship with, you know. And so when you go out at the age of 18, what you find to be attractive in the other person, having a certain unique characteristics. By the time you get burnt a few times, by the time you're like 30, 35, everything about you will change. Sometimes it's your own experience that forces you to realize that perhaps you went the wrong path, you're straight, you know. And it's an evolving process, you know, so. Yeah. Um, so what happens in the transition like, with society when they decide or like collectively um, transitions from one religion to the next, meaning the gods like Pan, now you see representations of him like Peter Pan, um, Athena, you can find um, her on video games, but then with Zeus and you have uh, Jesus instead of Moses, and they choose certain gods and religions to, I guess, hold to higher standards, but then the others kind of get filtered away. Um, is there a collective mindset or is there a movement? Like, what's the transition like in society where they choose and divide um, the religion? You know, one of the nice things about these shows like America Got Talent or Britain Got Talent is that for the longest time in our history, you had a handful of people, for some strange reason, they had the power, they had the attractiveness, maybe they came from a privileged background, and that fetched them a good amount of following. Okay. Now, what's happening with these shows is that you have a 10-year-old, you know, who just comes on the stage. There was this 10-year-old Indian, I don't know if you've seen it, in America Got Talent, she had been playing guitar for only about four years. She was uh, taught by her father, and then she did the YouTube clicks to figure out how to play. And it's a mixture of heavy metal and Indian raga. She's amazing. You know, she really, really is amazing. And so what you have is, if you... Look at, for example, the likes of Jesus. He's living at a time where there are two or three other people very much like him. There are magicians like him. They raise the dead like him. But for whatever the reasons are, he is the person who gets all the advertisements. You know, for whatever the reasons are, there is a pull uh, on his way to somewhere to kill a few Christians has a vision. And he has enough power you know, to make Jesus the main honcho of the scenario. And then you have history. I mean, right now, if you were to look at what's happening in the political world, no one in the past maybe 30, 40, 50 years would dare to say that Hitler was right in any way. Okay. Now, what you have right now is there are lots of upcoming presidents, you know, who kind of have the same rhetoric, you know, they have the same mindset. And what history does, history breaks and history makes. History is nothing but a piece of advertisement. It keeps blasting or blitzing people with a certain set of images. And once the human psyche buys those images, they have the popularity. You know, that's how it is. Um, I mean, consider uh, there came a point, I'm not quite sure what century this was, but it was the Muslims against the Christians, and they were very close at the border of France. They had demolished all the countries and all the con cultures. And all the people who had been conquered, they became Muslims. Imagine for a moment if it wasn't raining heavy that particular month and the chariots were not stuck in mud. And if the weather was dry, you know, and the horses and the chariots could very easily, you know, get into the French border. 
the Western world would not be a Christian world. It would be a Muslim world. You know. Um, I'll give you a different example, which is a bit more fleshy, very meaty. <sighs> Let's say you are 17 and you walk into my class. And let's say you become very attractive to the way I express ideas. Okay. And as you sit in the classes more, as you take more classes from me, you realize little by little, you're adopting some of my personality, some of my animation. When you go home and you talk about religion and politics, you throw out my ideas to your family, to your friends. And as my ideas and my presence inside you grows more, you realize you don't really care for geography, you don't care for history, you just want to major in philosophy and religious ideas. And then eventually you leave Laney and you go to CSU San Francisco or Harvard. Well, you have been contaminated by Laney advertisement, i.e. me. And you expect that when you go to Yale, okay, you're going to encounter people like me. But you're disappointed because that's not the case for you. Now imagine instead of that, I catch you at the age of 45. With 45 years of history, some brokenness, some fantasies, some ridiculous ideas you have about this and that. Now you and I meet. And let's say you're still interested in some of the things that I say. But at this stage, the sort of advertisement I offer you can't compete with 45 years of history. You'll find it entertaining, maybe exciting, inspiring, but eventually they'll be dismissed. So in some ways, it really depends on at what point, at what stage you're presenting ideas to people, advertising things to people. If people happen to be privileged, they're set in their ways, all you can hope for is a moment of inspiration. If, on the other hand, you catch them where they're confused, and that's one of the nice things about confusion and dread and depression, because confusion is like this empty bucket, and it's ready to receive. It's ready to be told what to do, where to go, what not to do, because that's what confusion is. You're desperately looking for someone to guide you. You know, so what you have, for example, in terms of, say, someone like Jesus, well, you know, he told his disciples, I'm going to come back after a couple of years. They wait and wait and wait. And nobody shows up. So what do they do? Well, they begin to write, you know, all these different books. And then they begin to kind of congregate at each other's houses. And they say, wait a minute. Why don't we just build a place like a room? You know, that's where we can gather. It becomes our church. It becomes our, you know, sacred grounds. So, and that's what history really is. It's nothing but advertisements, you know. I'll, I'll give it to you this, this other way. Hitler worked for the government, the German government. It was very mediocre. But before working for the government, he was an artist. And Germany, by then, was bankrupt. You know, um, it was very poor. It was a complete mess. And so when he told his parents that he wants to be an artist, they spanked him, slapped him. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar what happens to the soul of an artist when he gets broken, when it's not appreciated, when uh, people don't embrace it, nourish it. You know, because that's who you are. You're just an artist. So he desperately tried to find a job, and eventually he found one. And he became a spy. So what the German government told them is, why don't you go to these movements? You know, they're underground. They're probably there to kind of topple our government. Just figure out what they're talking about. Okay. Now, as he sits in these meetings, again, remember, what you hear is nothing but collection of advertisement, and for whatever reasons are, some are attractive, some are repelled by you. But Hitler sits and begins to in really enjoy what he's hearing. He quits his governmental job and he just goes to these meetings. 
And then by chance, he happens to be told, why don't you go on the stage and say a couple of things? There was something about him that was charismatic. So he goes on the stage and he begins to like scream and shout and be a bit more animated. And he said, this is really, really amazing. The more I scream, the louder are people applauding me. And then little by little, word got around that there is this kid, you know, for whatever the reasons are, he was really, really good. Okay. Now, if you have an Eckhart Tolle and a Moses and a Jordan Peterson, well, Hitler has to compete with all of that. And there's a good chance that Jordan Peterson is going to be much more eloquent, much more reflective than Hitler. He's not going to, you know, have much headway. But we're talking about a Germany that's poor. We're talking about a Germany that wants to go upward but can't. And what are you looking for when you're poor? Are you looking for someone to help you out? Who do they find? Hitler. Great piece of advertisement. And little by little, his following just grows more and more and more and more. It's all advertisement. Uh, by the time Christianity came onto the scene, paganism just lost its following. Christianity was way too powerful. And you know, it, it may be that in a couple thousand years that Jesus will be irrelevant. I mean, you don't really know what history does to the gods. History does to people uh, weird things, and it'll do to gods and religions weird things. And that's how it's always been. But it's good to get an advertisement when you're really, really young, a good piece of advertisement, you know. Uh, if you have parents who can kind of model for you from the age zero to about maybe 10, 15, what a good relationship looks like, you will go into bad relationships. But what you have in mind, I want something that's the carbon copy of my parents. And the higher the standards, the more difficult it's going to be for you to find a model. That's one of the nice things about America. Everything is cheap. So everything goes. And everything is valuable. You know, it's like saying, well, it's my opinion and I have the right to hold that opinion. It's true. In this culture, it's true. In other cultures, not so much. Any... I guess, um, why is it so easy for one person to have such a lack of awareness of self that they can be so sensible or of things outside of themselves or of others, I guess? Um, like it's easy for somebody to come out of themselves and judge others, but they can't see their own things or their weaknesses or their own personal issues. Can you say that question again? Um, I guess it's based around lack of awareness. Why is it so easy for us to have such a great lack of awareness of ourselves? There is a virus in our software. I'm not really quite sure. Uh, first, awareness is really, really difficult. Uh, and the reason why it's difficult and painful is because we don't come out uh, or we don't come into life with a toolbox that has all these different tools so that we can combat the difficulties of life, become blind. And the only way that you can gain some sight is by assumptions. And that's all we have, assumptions, a set of assumptions. And some of these assumptions is just, they're very innate, they come with you. Most of it, about 90% comes from the outside, you know. Um, my son will cheat whatever game he plays. There's just something about what it means to be human in him, which is very, very visible. We don't like to lose. You know, he hasn't been socialized. I mean, he hasn't walked in society to be contaminated by the forces out there. It's, this is the way he's always been, you know. So there is something about us that does not like to lose. And we are willing to cheat, we are willing to lie, we are doing, willing to do all sorts of things. Now, if your question is, well, when is your son going to be mindful enough, aware enough to stop cheating and play fair? Uh, 
Can I tell you a story? On the day that we were shipped to India, I remember uh, this is the 1976-77. We were on Lufthansa. The plane was empty. It was just my brother and I. He was 10, I was 11. A couple hours prior to getting on the plane, I remember pushing my sister. She's eight years younger than I am. And she hit the back of her head to the concrete. And then she cried. And I laughed. On the plane, we were just goofing around, running from here to there. And it all of a sudden dawned on me that we're going to a land we've never been. We don't even speak the language. We don't have any relatives there. We don't know anyone. And I'm not going to see my parents for the next two years. And then I remembered my sister. Instead of, you know, the last few minutes, maybe you should embrace her, give her a kiss on the cheek, and say, I'm going to miss you. You just bullied her, and then you laughed. Now, if your question is, well, at what point did I become aware of what I had done to my sister? It's the point that I realized I have no power in my life. My parents aren't there. My sister isn't there. I don't even, I'm going to a land I've never been. Language I don't even speak. Food I don't even like. People I don't even like. And in that poverty, there was a good amount of pain. And then I felt ashamed. And I felt guilty. And I felt sad for what I had done. So you need all sorts of different components to come together for awareness to come forth. You know, uh, we are creatures who, for the most part, are on autopilot 24-7. Once in a while, some event happens in life that you're forced to stop. And when you stop, you know, it's like, I don't know. I mean, you go to Costco and um, you spend all this money and you don't really care about the homeless, the poor. And uh, as you're exiting uh, the Costco, there is a man or a woman, not young. They're about like 80 and they have a cane. They have three legs. And something about you feels bad or guilty. Well, why didn't you feel the guilt, you know, before you bought the 95-inch TV? Well, because there was no one to impose pain, awareness. You know, now you have a big TV in the back of your truck, and this woman is watching you. You know, she's all wrinkled, she's old, she's sick, she's limping. And all you got to do is just give her a buck. So awareness, again, it's, it's enormously difficult. And that's why you have cults. And those cults, the leader of those cults, interview people. Very much like a job interview, because they don't want their time to be wasted. And most people really can't qualify. It's too much. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to right now. Again? <laughs> Anyone else? Confusion? We are creatures after power. Power creates stability. Power creates access to future. It's one of the things that Saint... Um, Francis of Assisi had argued, was about money. He forbid his disciples to have any money. He believed that since all of us can die at any moment, the only thing that should concern you is should you die right now and find yourself in the presence of God, and should God look upon you, what are you going to say to him? The last minute or the last breath, what were you thinking about? What were you doing? So he said, let's remain poor. And as long as you're poor, you're in pain. You have no idea how your tomorrow is going to be. Okay? You leave your tomorrow to the hands of the gods. What money does, he had argued, is that you plan for your tomorrow. So you say to your companion, what do you want to do tomorrow? Let's go to Great America. Well, Great America demands like at least a thousand bucks. What do you want to do for dinner? Well, let's go to Barney's. Well, that's like 50, 60 bucks. <clears throat> so... Now, the truth is, for the majority of us, you need to have access to your future. You need power. You need stability. It's not good to be homeless. It's not good to not know what's going to happen to you the next few minutes. Okay? Now, 
this can be a physical thing, this can be a psychological thing, this can be an emotional thing, it could be a spiritual thing. If you happen to suffer from spiritual poverty, well, darkness is your home and you like it because to some extent, <clears throat> darkness or say, by the time you get to the spiritual poverty, you don't really care about the physical stuff. If you have approached the spiritual path in the right way, okay? Remember, you have to have the money to walk away from it. And you walk away because you say, I thought, you know, I would work 50, 60 hours a week and that would make me powerful and the power would make me happy. Buying a house, buying a car, this and that. You come to a breaking point where you realize, no, I've slaved away, I'm not really happy. So you walk away. You know, the guy who inherited Baskin Robbins, uh, he was, I think, 28, 29. He was a little weird to begin with. He was more of a hippie. But he inherited all this wealth. But because of his temperament, because of his life experience, he said, I don't want to run a business. I don't want to make ice cream. I don't care for ice cream. I don't care for money. So he just left. You know. <clears throat> now, Sometimes, I suppose, confusion comes when you are married, when it's your last year. I had a student some years ago. Uh, she just needed one class. And, you know, sad for her that I was teaching a class. And sad for her that she just happened to be open to ideas and possibilities. You know, hello. And so I, and so, you know, married, four kids, beautiful life, stable. She took the ideas a bit too seriously. Everything fell apart for her. It's not good. Confusion is lack of power. And the more confused you are, the weaker, the more poor you are. Now, the problem with being really, really poor is that people can sell you all sorts of advertisements. I mean, just look at what happened in the 1960s. All these ridiculous people coming from the East and the West and the North and the South to America selling them these ridiculous ideas. You know, one of them happens to be Ramana Mahesh Yogi, was it? The guy who came up with transcendental meditation. You know, and when you look at it now, I mean, it's still, you know, in existence. And for those of you in this class who are looking for enlightenment, find a center. Someone will interview you and they'll say, well, your way to salvation really is this particular word. And you have to repeat this word 50 times a day. And it's going to cost you about $15,000. And should you be poor enough, gullible enough, stupid enough, ignorant enough, you're going to fork out, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars and you're going to get a word and you're going to sit home and say Coca-Cola, 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 Coca-Cola. And then no doubt you will have some dreams, some experiences and that'll get you some power, power through assumption that yes, you had an experience and Coca-Cola is a sacred, you know, a couple of words. Um, and then you walk around telling people that you're enlightened and you have a way to their salvation as well. Uh, one of the nice things that happened in 1986, I think, in, in the Bay Area was the earthquake. You know, there can be nothing more stable than the ground on which you walk. And the earthquake came about, you know. Um, 89? Yeah, I think I was born in 89. Oh, yeah? 89. And um, you just didn't know where to walk anymore, where the ground is not going to open up and swallow you. No. So I think if you're in the business of confusing anyone, you know, if you take a class and the class just forces you to ask a lot of questions, I think anyone who <clears throat> creates a confusion to some extent has the obligation to provide, provide 
some shade for you so that once in a while you can kind of rest and you know rest in the in the shade before you go back to the sun or confusion it's too much you know you can be confused about tiny parts of your life you can be confused about a whole host of things about your life that is devastating you know when you have lived for 40 years you've accomplished a whole host of things and at the age of 40 41 42 you say my life is crap that's devastating I mean, the midlife crisis, and it's a relatively new thing. You know, people used to go through stages, uh, initiation rites. Like when your mom calls and says, okay, why don't you come to the kitchen and peel some potatoes for me? She no longer looks at you as a kid. You're an adult now. You're your mom's helper. When your father, you know, comes to you and says, well, why don't you read this book for me? Birthdays didn't exist. So... Alexandra Robbins, I think, was the woman who wrote this book about 30, 40 years ago. And the book is called Quarter Life Crisis. You no longer really have to wait to feel confusion at the age of 40. Now people experience it at the age of 20. I mean, that's, that's devastating. You know, your parents should guide you. Then you go to school. You have your next, like, up to the age of these 30, your life is there for you to kind of make, which is you graduate from high school, you go to college, then you go to university, then you look for a job. And then uh, by the time you're 40, 45, then you sit back and you say, okay, is this what my life amounts to? But now you have power to some extent. You know, but when you lose all of that, you know, you're talking about divorce, you're talking about loneliness, you're talking about depression. I mean, it's like human beings these days start life being poor live in great amount of poverty and then die poor as well. And that creates a good amount of confusion and anger because you're not just dealing with confusion. You, if you haven't been socially trained, uh, the confusion turns into anger. And then you have, you know, all sorts of things that you see around Oakland. If on the other hand you've been civilized well, well you repress the negative emotions that are the outcome of confusion. Maybe you draw, maybe you write, maybe you have friends with whom you talk, you know, maybe you go on a walk, you know, but when you've been abandoned from a very young age, who the hell knows what's going to happen? Uh, confusion is good if it's controlled, like anything else. It's like you take your date home, your mom says this is the wrong person for you, and she sits you down, and you are very certain that you love this woman, but with your mom's encouragement, now you begin to doubt a little. You know, now you're stuck. Love, maybe not love. And you're going to have a many, many restless nights, if of course you're open to your mom's suggestions. That confusion is really, really good, because you can always go back to your mom, you can always ask her questions, she can always be a support system, can always be nourishing, protective of you, you know, but uh, that particular protected, you know, uh, confusion is really, or control confusion is really, really good because it makes you think and it makes you grow. It uh, forces you to check your emotions, examine them, be aware of them, you know. Um, one of the awful things that happened around the I think it was around the 15th century or so, because for the longest time in our history, artists really had only one function. You talk about Christianity. You know, you grab a blank piece of paper or a canvas, and you put a cross, you know, you build a nice little house, some uh, mountains or hills in the background, you know, a river, and that's what you do. You promote Christianity. But then what happens is, all of a sudden, you realize your, your culture is now creating people who want to examine Christianity, maybe even attack Christianity. Now you have two different kinds of arts. One promotes, one discourages. Now, for all these years, people knew that just in case life treats them badly, they'll just go to church. Now you have a different piece of advertisement. Jesus didn't exist. I mean, that's one of the things about Frankfurt School that took place in Germany. You know, I mean, the, the, especially the New Testament. 
no other sacred text has been put under the microscope so closely and so heavily like the New Testament. There is this fascination that scholars have with Jesus. And add to it the fact that all these books keep being found in Egypt and other places that give a different portrayal of Jesus, different image of Jesus. And so by the time you get to the 19th century, you know, you'll find so many contradictions in the New Testament, you have no idea what to believe anymore. I mean, imagine if every time your life would break down, you know, it's like when your car breaks down, you pick up the phone, and you call the road service. This time your life breaks down and you call Jesus and he's right there, you know. But with all the new discoveries and with all the skeptics, with all the atheists, with the secular culture, someone looks at the genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew and says, oh, well, Matthew's genealogy takes Jesus all the way back to Abraham, father of the Jews. Why? Because Matthew is a Jewish gospel. But then you look at the Gospel of Luke. He doesn't take it to, to Abraham. He takes it all the way to Adam, the father of humanity. Why? Well, because whoever wrote the Gospel of Luke had an axe to grind with the Jews. He didn't like the Jews very much, for political reasons, perhaps. But nevertheless, now you read, you sit back as a student, as a faithful believer, perhaps. You want to figure out, well, you, and your life is like strand in the middle of nowhere. You say, well, well, why couldn't Matthew just take Jesus all the way back to Adam? You know, why, why is, is there such a difference? Well, because for political reasons. It was written at a different time with different agenda and intention. And now you say, okay, what the hell do I believe in now? And now confusion comes about. You know, next time you want to go to church and pray because your life is broken, you look at it and say, no, this is fake. You know, there's a reason why this church was built. Because people didn't believe that Jesus would come back. So they just made the sanctuary. Uh, whatever power you have in your life, hang on to it tightly. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> What's the difference between Jens, Angels, um, Arishas, Asuras? Why are the, the religion and gods our helpers? Um, what do we internalize from these other entities that come along with the gods? Can I be honest? Oh, gum. <laughs> the Catholics, for the longest time, it was a real thing, you know, that I need two, if you don't mind. Just one more. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the Catholics, for the longest time, uh, in, were engaged in this very scholarly research and debate as to which shoulder carries which angel, you know, the dark or the light, Satan or... <sighs> and then eventually they just gave up. And I guess the point I'm trying to make is, once in a while, when we have our own Persian gatherings, there are people who talk about jinn, jinns, you know, uh, the ones that are light versus the ones that are filled with fire versus the ones that are filled with darkness. And I sit back and I'm amused and um, it kind of makes me a little sad because I just don't care for them. Uh. Uh, yeah, I don't really know how to answer your question. I wish I could, but I can't. But can I tell you a story? About 40 years ago, we had a guy in one of our gatherings who was married, two kids, he had this vision or experience that he saw Moses, he saw the burning bush, uh, he saw 
gins and all that stuff. And it just disrupted his life to the point that he divorced and he just stopped seeing his kids. And then we were sitting at the gathering and he was just talking about all this gibberish. It was good for him, bad for the rest of us. I think as long as you can be grounded, you can have your feet on the ground at the same time, kind of like Thales. I don't know if you know Thales, a Greek philosopher. Um, they asked him, you know, you have all this charisma, you have all this knowledge, why don't you sell it and make some money? Why do you live in a hut like that? This is where philosophers need to be grounded, at the same time they need to look to the heavens. You know. Sometimes I feel these questions encourage people to just look up there and forget the fact that they have to walk on ground. And so they get a little older, they realize they need food, shelter, clothing, security, you know, by the age of 40, they have nothing. So it creates more confusion and headache for them. Yeah, so, uh, I guess the short answer is I don't really know. Yeah, yeah, Nina. Abi. What? Say <laughs> No? Uh. Hello. Hello. Yeah. And it was in India. Sixty groups of people. And they grew up with carrying pots of less um, water. And walk there and it was fortunate. Yeah, yeah. For a mile. Yeah, yeah. It, it look. Um, it really depends on. <sighs> Can I do this in a different way? <clears throat> Let's say I'm a single man. I'm sixty. Okay. Do I like to be alone? No. Do I like loneliness? No. Do I like depression? It depends on what kind, but generally no. Do I like confusion that removes power from me and plunges me into this dark hole? Probably not, especially if I'm not being creative. Now imagine I go to some coffee shop and a young woman comes and sits next to me and says, oh, I'm very attracted to you. And she happens to be like 25. Okay. Now there's a tremendous amount of power there that a 25 year old is attracted to a 60, almost a dead guy. Okay. She's showing a lot of skin. Okay. I know how jealousy works. I know how possessiveness works. I know how security and relationships work. And at my age, I'm not interested in those things. I'm not interested in chasing after someone protecting what my relationship is all about, which is I'm um, with a 25-year-old and she's showing it to everybody, okay? I guess the point I'm trying to make is the following. It's not so much the teacher. It's what the student is looking for. Some are looking for magic tricks. They can read the Gospel of John. In that, there are no teachings. There is no single story, not a single story. If you want a guy who is profoundly arrogant, egocentric, Gospel of John. In that book, he talks about himself at least 60 times. He says, I, I this, and I that. I mean, none of us in this class enjoy anyone who talks about themselves so much. And forgive me for being that guy. Okay? None of us do. For whatever the reasons are, it just leaves a very bad taste in our mouths. Why the hell does he talk about himself all the time? Really, you're not that great. Shut up. Okay? Now, some people want to sell Jesus Christ 
And so all they do is just talk about the gospel of John. That's what they're looking for. Some people are looking for a more humble version of Christ. A Christ that has tasted doubts. A Christ that has tasted abandonment. So they look at the gospel of Mark. They can taste a bit of humility in it. There's a guy with all the good intentions. He gets whipped left and right. You know, on the cross, he feels abandoned. Now, India is a funny land. It's a bit ridiculous. You know, uh, it's filled with theory. All theory, you know. And uh, for some strange reason, you know, it's, it's uh, something of value to be able to sleep on a bed of nails for hours or stand there like a statue where your disciples carry you to the pool of water and wash you because your body can no longer move. Um, again, every culture creates its own version of saints and sinners. You know, India is just like that. If, on the other hand, you're no longer engaged in the bling of the spiritual world, you know, you're looking for substance. You're looking for understanding, clarity. You want to really understand. You know, it's, I mean, the Buddha was around people who were doing magic tricks. He didn't care for those things. Some of it is temperamental. Some of it is just you as a student are just curious beyond, and you're beyond those things. You really want to understand what the hell is going on. You know, that's one of the nice things about Sigmund Freud. He really wanted to understand. Uh, I'll give you an example. So there is this, what's his name? He, he goes by Prague. He's an Indian chess player. He's about 19. He's really, really good. It's quite awesome. And so uh, there is this new sage in India right now. He'll probably die soon. His name is Sadhguru. Okay? I don't know if any of you in Scots have heard of him. But nevertheless, he's one of those. Anyways, so uh, this young kid goes to Sadhguru in front of a whole host of other people and says, sometimes when I'm playing chess, I get so nervous and I get so stressed. Why is that? And Sadhguru, you know, closes his eyes, thinks a little bit and says, well, it's madness, isn't it? Why don't you just move the pieces? Just go with the flow. I mean, how stupid of a response can this be? You're like an athlete at a chess tournament. You want to win. You're competing. Being stressful is natural. Wanting to win is natural. You play chess eight hours a day. What, you go in there, what, to just go with the flow? What flow? Stress is good for you. It's something that Bjorn Borg used to say in the 1980s, that the worst thing that can happen to any athlete or tennis player is to just go to the court and not be stressed. And when you're not stressed, you're basically saying to your opponent, I don't respect you. And so you're just a bit casual on the court. And there's a good chance you may be beaten. Stress keeps you alert, keeps you aware. And it's human nature to want to win. You know, so India, to some, at least, you know, most of the stuff that I have seen on YouTube, it just fluff. It may be good for people who enjoy fluff, who enjoy uh, feeling inflated, you know, for a few moments. But I think it's good to understand. Yeah, isn't that true? God bless you. See, wise man. Anyone else? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, when it comes down to society and advertisements, and um, an event can, I guess, cause someone to um, reflect. Has there ever been an event in time or just uh, written about where society as a whole, as a full collective, um, the advertisements were just gone, removed? And if so, 
What was the outcome? Did it cause the destruction, evolution, or did society go move on and just create new advertisements? Rollo May, I think he's an American psychologist, he's dead now. Um, I think he was a mild student of Sigmund Freud, or at least he enjoyed his ideas. He wrote a book some years ago, it's called The Cry for Myth. And he examines the Greek culture, the Roman culture, uh, some of the other Western cultures, and he asked, when you examine these cultures and why they fell apart, it had to do with the fact that their myths were slowly stolen from them. Um, can I make this a bit more personal? Okay. You dress a certain way, which makes me think that there are certain things you believe in and there are certain rituals you engage with. And there is a certain way that you think about things. Okay? Those are your mythological narratives. They give you security, they give you purpose, they give you intentions, they make you relevant, they give you identity. You refer to yourself as this particular person with these particular characteristics. These are your myths. You are a country. And that country is being guided by a certain set of stories. Now imagine, that little by little, your narratives, all the things you hold sacred, begin to suffer some cracks. Little by little, these narratives begin to lose a sort of power they once held over your psyche. And one day you just wake up, look yourself in there and say, you know what? It doesn't mean anything anymore. I don't know why. It just doesn't mean anything anymore. And that's what happens to countries. You know, that they're guided by a certain set of stories. You know, it's kind of like what Freud had argued about parents. You know, whenever you cry, your mom and dad comes about. They come about and they take care of you. Whenever you have a question to ask, you go to them and they give you answers. Then one day you go to them and say, Dad, why did you bring me to life? Now... This is not a simple question that a child asks. It's, they've been like thinking and reflecting and feeling about this question for some days, and then they come to the parent. And for the first time, the child comes to realize up to the age zero to about eight, he looked at the father as the God, kind of like Confucianism. Okay? But now he asks his God a question and comes to realize his God is incompetent. And from that point, there's a crack in the relationship. Now the kid says, instead of talking to my father, I'm just going to read a book about it. Maybe I'm going to YouTube the stuff. Maybe I'm going to go to the workshop because my father doesn't know anything about anything. Okay. The moment your myths begin to crumble, you will lose stability. You will lose power. You will suffer confusion. And in confusion, there is a good amount of anger. Your husband or your companion comes in and says, yo, what's wrong with you? Don't talk to me. Why don't you dress the sort of way you always dress? It's none of your goddamn business. And there is this hostility to you that he had never seen or experienced before, but it's there nevertheless. And it's there for a good reason. All the things that used to make your life meaningful no longer are. I was uh, teaching ethics uh, at Laney maybe 20 years ago, and there was this wonderful, beautiful African-American kid who was playing football. His name was Chance. And I don't know how the conversation began, uh, but we had an older couple, African-American couple in the room, and they were talking about all the stuff about the African-American tradition and culture and chance. He was beginning to sweat heavily, and at one point he became really angry, and he raised his hand. He said, can I just, I just need to say something. Yeah, what is it? He looks at the older couple who were once married, but divorced, but very, on very, very good terms. He looks at them and says, you guys gave us nothing. I have nothing to hold on to as a young African-American in, in this culture. Nothing. I want to know what our narratives are. I want to go to a certain physical space to see those narratives living out, but there is nothing. Uh, he went to Cal eventually, uh, did sociology. I'm not quite sure where he is now, but the point I'm trying to make is the following. When your stories begin to get lost, 
You stand on nothing anymore. I mean, right now what's happening to the political aspect branch of America, it's devastating. Because this is what you see in third world countries. When you can buy justices, you know, when you can have buffoons as presidents, when you can just be overtly racist without any consequence. Yeah. Um, this is kind of going back to something we talked about earlier, um, but I was curious. Uh, we talked about like the connection between wisdom and power, right? And that when you don't have wisdom, you're confused, and that makes you more receptive to other people's influence. I was curious. When you don't have power. Not wisdom, you don't have power, any kind sure. of power. Sure, um, sorry. I, I guess I was curious, is there anything innately virtuous about wisdom? Because we think of wisdom as being a virtuous thing, being a wise person, being a good person. Um, but is it just that, is, is there something innate about wisdom that is worthwhile to us, or is it just that we want to be wise because it makes us more powerful? <sighs> Can I just put this in a very simple way? And it may not you know, be the best reply to your question. Your question is really, really good. Um, I may not be completely intellectually present to kind of answer your question in, in a way that may satisfy you, but nevertheless. Imagine wisdom to be like a knife, okay? It depends who's holding the knife. It depends to whom you're giving the knife. Okay. Now, if you have a companion and you love your companion, it would be wrong of me to tell you, Johan, what is love? Tell me what love is. Now, the truth is, at the age of 18 or 19, however you know, old you are, it'd be cruel for me to ask you that question. First, because you don't have the maturity, you don't have the life experience, you don't have the care and the passion to go on this long quest that usually takes about 30, 40 years to figure out what wisdom is. Okay? And then, even when you find it, it's going to be mostly theoretical. And then when you apply it, you may realize how dangerous it really, really is. Okay? Now, someone like Socrates, who we claim to be wise, would go around, ask people about love, and then people would feel insufficient. And then they would probably go home, ask their wives or husbands to come to realize, well, their wives and husbands can't really respond to that question, and then the, the relationship would fall apart. Okay? I think it's always good to give to people what they're ready for. But to know that, you have to spend some time with people. I can't just come to you and say, well, once you examine love, go home and thoroughly talk about it with your companion. If on the other hand, you had some relationship issues and you came to my office and you said, Amir, you know, I've been going through this issue for the past like five, six years with my companion. Well, how do I deal with it? Then I say, well, do you want to stay with her? Do you want to leave her? What the hell do you want? You know. And that would be a different story. Um, if you read the Gospel of Mark, it's very, very interesting because Jesus does not go out and sell wisdom to anybody out there. He reserves the meat for his own students, his own cult. When he goes out, he tells people stories, you know. Um, the other thing, I think, the concept of wisdom has changed over the years. You know, you would cherish the wisdom of your parents, you would cherish the wisdom of your grandparents, the wisdom of that was just inherently in the culture itself. 
Then when you were completely dissatisfied with the whole thing and you realize that your life is just wasting away, you're looking, yearning, longing for something that can be seen or touched or tasted or heard, then you go to, I don't know, you knock, begin to look for doors and knock on them until wisdom shows her face to you, you know. But we, were, we used to be very, very grounded. It's only been in the past maybe 50 years where people are looking for all these ridiculous things. They go to India, they go to Tibet, you know, because they think that there is wisdom out there somewhere to be found. Um, like anything else, there is a positive and negative. Um, it can be beneficial, it could also be dangerous. And the problem with public education, as you know, or maybe you don't, is that uh, sometimes you find people like me with big mouths, you know, who thinks a little too much about ridiculous things and come to class and spits out things that shouldn't be talked about. Not perhaps for you, but maybe for someone who may take some of these ideas more seriously. Uh, the other thing is that wisdom, first of all, people don't look for it. People don't look for wisdom. People look for security. People look for power, okay? Uh, and the sort of security and power they're looking for comes in going to school, getting a job, finding a therapist of sorts, you know, having some friends, having sex, drinking, having a good time, not staying home and watching ridiculous movies or being home alone depressed. That's the sort of power that people are looking for. And to overcome those diseases, well, you need secular power. You need knowledge of the physical world. You need knowledge of your physical body. You need to be socialized well so that people, that you are digestible to people. You can have a couple of friends with whom you can go and, and have a drink, have pizza with. Wisdom is a different thing. You know, um, that once you're done with the basic stuff of life, which is more complicated these days, then you can kind of, you know, does that, are we, is it, maybe not, yeah, so so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, tonight we were talk going to talk about the Ten Commandments. Yeah. I find what you talk about um, in the way of like America not having much of a culture because it's very young, it's very interesting to be true. But um, my like my wondering is like, for example, one of my best friends who's uh, he just. He immigrated here a few years ago from Jordan, and um, we're pretty close, and often we talk about how uh, he came to the United States because there was he thought it would be less corrupt um, as a teenager, as a younger teenager, and now that he's a little older, he sees like parallels between Jordan's corruption in government um, and how it can be dragged out to how it is here, and I think... It made me wonder, like, how much time does America, like, the United States, not the continent, but, like, how much time does the United States really have left until it begins really, like, falling under its own culture? You mean, like, falling apart? Yeah, it's already a little bit. Oh, well, I, I, don't, I don't really know. Um. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, but falling apart is really good because you begin to change narratives, you begin to change perspectives, your vision of happiness begins to change, beauty begins to change, philosophy all begins to change, and you can't, you can't uh, refine them if you're always in a state of privilege. It doesn't work. Yeah. Anyone else? Myla, you sure? Go ahead. You sure? Um, 
Uh, I never say this is a good thing, it's a bad thing. Falling apart is always bad. If you're a mechanic and you want to take apart the engine, but you're a mechanic and you know how to put it back, good for you. It engages you for the next five weeks. And you probably have a much better engine now. If on the other hand, you're no mechanic, but you just got like a wrench, and you're just curious and you just take everything apart, well, you can't put them back. You have no idea what goes where and how they function. Uh, one of the, again, awful things about uh, journaling, I think, it has some benefits, fine, is that like a mechanic, you bring everything out, you know, but you have no idea what to do with the things that you now see. It's too much. And then though it had 10 minutes of inspiration, clarity, you have 23 hours and 50 minutes of darkness and confusion and sadness and anger because you should have never brought up this stuff. There was a case that went before the Supreme Court some years ago. Um, I forget what it's called. Uh, psychological talk. It was people who have been keeping things down for maybe 30, 40, 50 years. And then all of a sudden they had this like inspiration to go somewhere and figure out what they have been hiding. Talk therapy. And so something, and they've been like living a very, very healthy life. But their wife like encourages them, honey, go over there. Sometimes you look sad. Why don't you go talk to someone about this? And so they do. And what happened is the moment this guy opened his mouth and began to spit up all the stuff that he had held, kept secret for many, many years, he came to a point where he could no longer take it. He committed suicide. So the wife sued the therapist and the company, saying that they had no right to drag or to pull the stuff out of him, the stuff that he had kept down within for all these decades. You know, if you're a mechanic, fine. If you're no mechanic, and you can be mechanic of the physical, I mean, look, the guy who did my chest, Brian Kane, he's a good mechanic. You know, I remember when I was talking to him about the procedure, he said, oh, I love, I love to open your chest and see what's, what? What do you mean you love? Uh, don't tell me you're looking forward to it. There's nothing to look forward to. He said, but I love it. I, I love doing this stuff. You know, his own father had died of a heart attack. Now, that's, that's a good person to give your body to. You know, if on the other hand, I see one of you and I say, <laughs> and you say, well, I have a knife in my pocket. Let me like cut open your chest to see what's going on. What the hell is that? You know, give yourself to someone who can break you and put you back together. The problem with the psychological part is it really is a game of patience. And you have, and everybody works with a different timetable. Someone can fix their issues in two months, someone in 20 years. The problem with envy is this then, that your issue, your timetable is 20 years. His timetable is two months. You look at him and you say, why can't I be like him? Now you got two issues, your problem, him. Now you covet, you know, the speed with which he recovered. And then now you begin to self-blame. Why can't I be like him? Am I cursed? Maybe I'm not seeing the right therapist. The truth is, it's going to take time. Physical things you can see. See, my left side, I couldn't move my shoulder too well. Little by little, it's healing. Psychological, emotional, spiritual stuff, it's always going to be in darkness. You have no idea when it's going to click and when you're going to get it. And now you may want to exercise patience. The truth is patience is, it has a really huge branch that's culturally manufactured. Which is, you have access to YouTube, you have access to cell phones, you text, everything happens in a nano speed. 
and now you want something that usually takes about 20 years to be fixed very quickly. Now, once you begin to have psychological habits that things need to get fixed really, really fast, as a culture, people slowly lose the ability to be patient about things that really demand patience. It's like here. I want to get an A in the class. What do I need to do? Nothing. You can't get... I'll give you an A. But it's a fake A. I can make you happy. But don't walk away after getting an A thinking that you're intelligent. You're stupid. And you're going to remain stupid for a long time. You're 18. You know. <sighs> yeah. I, yeah, please. Voting? <laughs> I've been in one huge revolution. A couple of mass movements. Voting is about hope. Voting is about people seeing some cracks in life, in society, in the world. And someone comes with fancy ideas and flowery words. They know exactly how to sell ideas to people. Uh, especially people who are uneducated unreflective and unreflective for good reasons life is far too busy you, you need to have two three jobs to pay rent to pay food you know to take care of your kids and so given the fact that most of us are we see too well the sort of poverty that exists out there and um, politics is now informational you know they sell ideas and they don't really mean anything but you're gullible enough to buy them and so whoever can sell the more colorful ideas, they're going to vote for him or her, you know. Um, but they're all cut from the same cloth. Um, in so far as voting, uh, I think Plato said it best, which is democracy is really, really bad because it's governed by the least qualified. I mean, look at us. Americans are not people who read. This is not a culture where people enjoy reading. This is not a culture where people enjoy thinking and reflecting. You know, I've gone to some gatherings, uh, non-Persian gatherings, and people don't sit and talk about politics and religion. It doesn't happen. You know, it's very casual. People drink, they gossip about like ridiculous things, and the party ends. Now, when you go to other gatherings from people, different cultures, you realize the centerpiece is politics because that's where they came from. You know, everything was turned upside down for them. You know, that's their bread and butter. So, what you have is about, I don't know, um, 400 million people in this country who have been governed by the illusion that their voice actually matters. And they vote. It gives them the illusion of power and autonomy and independence. You can't do much about that. And it's just not America, it's everywhere. Um, the problem also is if you don't vote for the stuff that takes place in Oakland, stuff that takes place in California, you know, you just allow these buffoons to just continue, you know, destroying what little good there is out there. You want to vote? Yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah. Um, the difference between superheroes um, and villains such as Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, and then you have the religious um, figures. 
when it comes to society, why do why are we so attracted to the unknown, the intangible, um, and why do we internalize it? Why does it look human? Why does it look um, Superman? He has powers. He's able to do all these things. Jesus is able to do all these things. And we see that in the mirror, almost like a mirror of something better than ourselves. Where does that come from? What was the guy's name? Feuerbach? Schleiermacher? Only Germans with ridiculous names. Um, he said something interesting, and I forget the exact phrasing. Uh, sometimes you go out there and you give 10 bucks to a homeless person or someone who's needy, and then you run to the same person the following week, you just look the other way, you don't even care. Okay. <clears throat> and so Schleiermacher or Feuerbacher or Beckenbauer, they had argued that he's a football player, by the way, soccer. <clears throat> he said that what we do is this. All of us in this class long for the permanence of compassion and generosity, but we see ourselves lacking and inconsistent. So what we do, we take this compassion that comes to me once in a while and we throw it up there beauty up there, wisdom up there. And you realize that, well, when you throw these goods up there, someone needs to hold them. And we give that person this name God or a superhero. Superman is never going to shy away from helping someone in need. He is consistent, something that you and I don't have, okay? Um, it may be because we are desperately looking for consistency and stability, but we can't really generate that. So we have no choice but to create certain fantasies. You know, uh, I don't know why Moses became so popular and so famous and we worship him. I mean, he killed a lot of people. So did Muhammad. At the same time, you know, you have pieces of advertisement supporting both the good and the bad. But there is something about us, I think that desperately desires someone who's more than human. You know, um, can I tell you a story? Is that okay? It's going to be a little weird. Oh yeah, plug your ears. It's not for you. <laughs> you guys all know who Rumi is, right? The great Sufi mystic. He saw God, right? And he played with God, right? And he wrote books. So let me tell you a story. There's a woman who's sitting on the sofa having some Dijon chips with yogurt. And all of a sudden she hears this noise coming from the outside. And it's very really distracting, you know. It keeps her from watching her movie. So she opens the sliding door to kind of hear this noise a bit more clear and better. And um, she can't believe what she's hearing. Her neighbor in the backyard. Oh, ooh, ah, ah, ooh. Does that sound familiar? She was having lots of fun. And um, she grew very, very jealous. And she was 
intensely overcome with pleasure. She said, I've been married all these years, and I've been doing this stuff with my husband all these years. I've never, ever, ever been able to make such sounds. I wonder what position they're doing it. Maybe I can tell my husband to repeat, you know, I do those positions. So she peeks through the hole in the fence, and she comes to realize that this neighbor of hers, this young woman, is having sex with a donkey. I know, Talia, it's young. God forbid. I told you to plug your ears. It wasn't, it's your fault. And um, she says, oh my God, this is amazing. I didn't know donkeys can do those things. So being envious and jealous, she goes to Lakeshore and buys herself a nice little donkey from uh, Trader Joe's. She comes home, feeds the donkey some carrot, and, you know, she takes a shower, wears her robe, goes to the backyard, this robe, looks at the donkey and says, Honey, I'm ready for you. <laughs> the donkey, of course, penetrates and... Uh, She's immediately taken to Highland Hospital, and there she dies. She doesn't die, but she recovers after a couple of weeks. Angrily, she walks to her neighbor's house and says, I saw you doing it with a donkey, and you were having so much fun. I did it as well. But I ended up in hospital. And her neighbor looks at her and says, well, didn't you see the watermelon? The woman says, what am I, what, what are you talking about? You didn't see the watermelon? And the story ends. Now, someone who has a certain view, certain perspective, certain position as to how philosophers or mystics should be and should behave, they're going to hear the story and say, Middle Easterners, you know, there's a reason why they're so backwards. Why would anyone come up with such a ridiculous, insulting, offensive story? Mystics should be like Jesus Christ, like St. Francis of Assisi. You should never talk about sex. Think about sex. Read some of the works of the Christian Desert Fathers. Now, I'm sure this story is connected to a question someone asked. <laughs> I forget the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> if I was to unpack the metaphors and the symbolism, it would be the following. And it goes back to your question a little bit about wisdom. The panting that this woman is hearing is about a student who wanted intimacy with a good amount of intensity, connection, relatability, but was never able to find it. He wanted union with God. But, so he has this yearning, and he hears someone having this intimacy. It's a good envy, and it's a good lust to have. And this person peeks through this hole through the fence. All of us in this class, we only have tiny little perspectives. We have no clarity about anything. We have a series of assumptions, that's all we have. If you have ever seen a donkey's private part, it is huge. For Rumi, the donkey's penis 
is a metaphor for the grandness and the awesomeness of God. The watermelon is a teacher, is a prophet. Only he or she knows how much of God you and I have the capacity to receive. You can't just sit and say, God, show yourself to me. Because if God was to show all of himself, you would combust. So you just need a little bit. And that little bit will carry you for your entire life, if not a few lifetimes. You don't hear that story very often in the Persian world. Um, we don't even hear too many people quoting from book five, which is a book that has so many images of pornography in it. <clears throat> and yet he's able to use all those human activities in a way that becomes profoundly divine and poetic. Rumi can do that because he's a superhero, because we don't see him as a human being, because there is a story about him that him and his teacher locked themselves in a room for two months, two weeks. No one knows what happened. Maybe they had sex. Who the hell knows? But the outcome was a changed human being, Rumi was. And so he uses whatever is out there to make the rest of us a bit more aware. Um, anyways, let's move on. Anyone else? Yes, Jordan. So, what about the watermelon? So, the watermelon, the donkey's penis has to go through the watermelon and then to the woman. Okay? Now, if you happen to have a great capacity for wisdom, okay, you get a smaller watermelon and a bigger donkey. If on the other hand you don't have a great capacity, you buy a huge watermelon and then a little donkey. You know, it's kind of like if you have a two-year-old son who comes to you and says, Dad, what's sex? Well, you have to give a huge watermelon because you say, well, it's honey, it's like ice cream. Okay. If on the other hand, your son or your daughter is a certain age that could pose some dangerousness, that they can go out there and do something naughty, but then you get a smaller water balloon. You give them a bit more reality. You shouldn't talk to them like adults. We do this all the time. You know. Uh, so, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. So the woman has a hospital. Uh, Highland Hospital. Yeah, so that traumatized her. Just um, on a metaphorical wise, like when it comes down to the wisdom that she would have had, or did that boost her to where she wasn't supposed to be? There is a book, uh, for those of you who are interested, it's called The Invisible Way. Um, there was a guy, there was a first volume to this book, which is called The Last Barrier. It was a Western guy in Turkey looking for antiques, goes into a shop. Uh, it was closing time and uh, just asks an irrelevant question, which is to the owner, do you know anything about the dervishes? Not knowing that he's talking to a teacher. The second volume has a story in it, which is there is a woman, a young woman whose name is Noor. Uh, she hangs out with this teacher. Uh, they never talk about religion or philosophy. But what Rashad Field, uh, this Westerner, comes to understand later on, is that this woman was given a bit too much when she was not ready. And her interior couldn't take it. So psychologically, she broke. You know, um,
I can, let me give this to you in, in a perhaps more digestible way. Imagine you are 18 and you accidentally run into a 45 year old man. And you're assuming you're hetero and all that. Now you're in high school, let's just say, or your first year of college, you're 18. And tradition, custom usually is, hang out with your own kind. Uh, well, with 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds. And both of you can suffer a good amount of confusion and then heartache, all that. But you, ran in, you run into this 45-year-old man, and uh, he's very, very, very mature. Now, something about women at a, from a very, very young age, perhaps maybe they know, maybe they don't know, but they long for stability because they're a carrier of potential being a mother. Okay? They're like an oven. And they know this from a very, very young age. So they're always looking for someone who could be dependable and stable, like a rock, Peter. Okay? And so you realize that this 45-year-old, for whatever the reasons are, even though you're very scared to tell your parents that you're dating a 45-year-old, nevertheless, you continue dating and eventually you get married. The beautiful man. A year after the, into the marriage, he dies. He gets ran over by an 18 wheeler. Or 18 wheeler? Yeah, truck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. An ugly looking truck. You feel sad. And after you have overcome your grief, you say, all right. I'm young, I'm only 19, 19, maybe 20. I should go out there and like, find myself a date. The problem that you have is you didn't go out with a loser. You went out with someone who's profoundly mature. At the age of 19, you have a standard that's up here. All the people your own age or close to your own age, their standards are even below you. Okay. And so there's a good chance that you will never find a man like the one you had. So you only have to find a way to be okay with someone who's lesser and just tolerate him. What you have in this woman, this young woman in the book, or anyone who's given too much at the wrong time is that you can break them to the point of no return. So you have to be very, very careful, and wisdom can do that. You know, once you begin to question, I mean, seriously question love, there's a good chance you will become paralyzed for the rest of your life. Because you're looking for this ideal that can't be found down here. Anyone else? You sure? What time is it? Maybe I can just finish up the Ten Commandments yeah. right now. Really? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Johan. Um, I'm curious what you think about the Ten Commandments. Anyone else before we do the at least a couple of them? Go ahead. Uh, what's practical? For who? I used to have a lot of athletes, football players in my classes uh, from Laney because everybody would assume that they're going to like, get picked by you know, a team. Uh, only a couple were 
maybe five or six. The rest I have no idea, you know, what happened to them. The desire to be picked by the 49ers is like a desire to be like Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with that. But it would be profoundly wise for you to have a backup plan. Do business, do computer science, just in case you hurt yourself on the field, just in case you're not that great, and time will reveal that to you. Uh, just in case, you know, you're no good at football or you lose interest, you have the computer science to fall back on, you know, that can support you. I think if you were to go back to Johan's questions about wisdom and why all of a sudden everybody wants to become wise, you lose this, this sense of just the practical aspect of life. I know all of us are bored and want to experience inspiration. This is a classroom, man. I'm part of a system that's bankrupt. You know, the sewer system is so clogged in education. It really, really is. Look at this as a business. Okay, so I give you a night of inspiration. Don't expect inspiration every goddamn night. I'm a boring guy with ridiculous ideas. Do the assignments, get the A, and go your way. That's being practical. That's being realistic. That's being seasoned. That's being mature. But to come to class saying, well, I want to be inspired. This class is boring. Well, fuck you. How stupid could you be? You know, where in life can you go to be inspired every goddamn moment? You know, and that's the problem with, like, this place. Everybody wants to be excited all the time. And that's not the way life works. Come to class expecting to be bored to death. And if there's a nice surprise, good for you. You know, not everyone's going to make it in life. You know, just go to school, make some money. You know, just, it's difficult, man. I mean, it's difficult to keep a job for like 20 years, to have the same car, you know, to have the same companion. These are like things that people used to do. It's very natural. Now everything that used to be so basic has become so complicated. And people come to class and say, I want to be wise. What's the path to that? Don't drop out of school. But that wasn't my question. I know I'm boring, at least pretend that you like me a little bit. So when it comes to me giving your final grade, say, oh, well, I remember her, you know, their body language was decent. They deserve it like a C. But if you come to class, you're always sleeping and you're yawning and your body language is like shit. But what the hell do you expect? I'm not Jesus Christ, I'm a regular chum. Anyone else? Talia. <sighs> Diana. Alexis. Uh, the what? Like tolerance. tolerance, yeah. What? <laughs> There is this Thai place in Roseville. It opened up about maybe five, six years ago. It's called My Thai Kitchen. So they come to your table and they say, okay, what level of spiciness would you like it? From one to five or zero to five. And then you say, oh, zero to five. I'll do a three. Thinking a three is like one grain of pepper. Okay. Now the dish comes to your table, you put it in your mouth, and you're about to like scream. You say, oh, well, I can't really tolerate three. So you call the person and say, can you change that to a two, a bit milder? Again, the food comes to your table and you taste it a little bit and say, oh my God, this is too much. And then you say, I want zero. Okay. And then they go back to the kitchen, they bring this food, and it's still very spicy. And I guess the answer to your question is none of us know our capacity until we are tested, very much like the book of Job. You know, 
we have a tendency of overestimating ourselves that we are in the proper place in life to look for wisdom, to be a good student, to be married, to be a mother, to be a father, to be a decent companion, to be a student. No, you only have the power to enroll in classes. Whether or not your ears are suitable to hear, whether or not you're able to listen to what you're hearing, whether or not you're able to understand what you're listening to, those are a completely different set of stories. You know, so this idea of tolerance really comes with an event takes place. It's like Mai Tai kitchen. You eat the food and you say, okay, well, I don't think I'm made for this. Okay. Um, and it may be that you go to a restaurant where there is no refund. They're not going to make the dish again. Say, so, well, you know, this is what you asked for. You want... Uh, spicy number two, but it's going to cost you 25 bucks, you know. Um, and usually because you thought that you could, but life shows you that you can't, that you don't have the enough, enough tolerance or patience or stamina, resentment comes, anger comes, your ridiculous notion of justice comes, you know, and then everything gets messed up. So, yeah. one of the rules of really, really good teachers is that they never tell you what you should do. You must always ask. Always. So you don't feel impos imposed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I was wondering what, um, coming of age, <clears throat> ceremonies are really huge. Yeah, yeah. But I'm wondering if um, you think there are certain experiences that are crucial for coming of age as well. Certain so what? Experiences? You said? You know, in this country, uh, getting a license is a huge deal. Used to be, at least. Because your father teaches you how to drive, and then he buys you a car. It's a huge deal. That at the age of 18, your parents say, you can date now, that you're a bit more responsible. It's a huge deal. That you have the right to vote. It's a huge deal. In other cultures, you know, you get married at the age of 21. Huge deal. That it's your initiation into adulthood. But when you lose those stories, then uh, when, when the culture kind of loses those stories, then you wait for artists to create rites of passages. And having said that, I must confess, I have forgotten your question. I'm at an age where I just forget things. Who are you again? I'm just kidding. What was the question? In New Guinea, they have, and there are lots of cultures who do these things. In New Guinea, they have a ceremony where you're sitting in your room or your tent all alone, having a good time playing Nintendo or Donkey Kong. And all of a sudden, like, you know, like three, four men with masks come in and they wrestle you violently. And your task is to unmask them. And they will let you. And that's your initiation to adulthood. You're no longer 12. Or when you go on a Native American vision quest, you know, um, where the elder of your community kind of sits you down, gives you something to smoke, and then you have a vision of sorts. Um, and you see an animal. You see a bird. And from that point on, everything about your life is going to be changed. When you don't have those stories, then you got to just figure things out on your own. I mean, right now, your initiate passage to adulthood is drinking, and then smoking, and then porning. You know, these are the sort of rituals we have currently. Joining a fraternity and doing crazy things.
What's the discernment and acceptance that we have when it comes to, um, I guess, someone coming down from the mountain with the commandments? Why do we accept that? <clears throat> uh, when it comes down to the preacher versus uh, somebody on drugs screaming and talking to themselves, the, uh, we flock to them and we accept what they have to say. Why is that? Why, uh, if you talk on the phone and you tell us that you're talking to your mother, why would we all accept the fact that you're talking to your mom when we don't see her and we don't see God and we don't see who this crackhead is talking to? <laughs> Um, where is that, that, where do we discern, how do we make the connection, like, okay, I understand that what you're going through is real versus he's crazy, or they're crazy? Well, for the longest time in our, at least, history, um, to be crazy was to have bad spirits inside you, and you were in need of exorcism, okay? We no longer call it being spiritually crazy. What we now call it is, you know, mental disability or mental sickness or mental illness. So the culture and our interpretation of crazy has changed a little bit. It's not enough for someone to come on TV or anywhere and just, you know, talk, big talk, and the rest of us follow him. There are a couple of ingredients that they also need to have something about you must be attracted to something about them. Okay? That's number one. The attraction is very important. And whatever it is that you're attracted to, there has to be charisma, there has to be magnetism, there has to be relatability. You know, there are, again, lots of things at play, and I, I don't have uh, the, the knowledge to kind of explain all of this. Uh, we don't flock. You know, you need a David Koresh, you need a Jim Jones. Uh, I mean, I don't know why Joshua in the Old Testament, uh, why people are so fond of him. Because he just goes to a city and kills a bunch of old people and a bunch of kids. And when he asks God, why do I need to do this? God says, just, just do it. That's the commandment. You know, um, there is something about us that desires to accept blindly, you know. And it's more intuitive than anything else. And the, the other, I think, aspect is with the passage of time, everything falls apart. You know, even Aldous Huxley, I think he said it best. He said it, I'm just kidding. He said it best. Um... You know, imagine Jesus Christ walking around and preaching, and inspiring people. And he gets to be 50, 60, 70. And he's old now. And he didn't really spend too much time with his wife or he didn't spend too much time with his kids if, let's just say, he was married. And now he's old and sick and he needs someone to take care of him. But there is no one there. So he's going to look back and say, really, I spent all of my time, all of my energy, talking to stupid people about stupid things where I should have just sat back and taken care of my health, for example. Okay. And what basically he's saying is spiritual stuff is ridiculous. Your physical body, if it gets sick, well, emotionally you're you know, paralyzed, intellectually you're paralyzed, your soul goes away because your body has power over you. you know? And I guess the point is, with the passage of time, all things just crumbles. You have these tiny little moments in life where you come to worship another human being. It can be a romantic love, it could be like finding a teacher, whatever the case may be. You know, sometimes I wonder what's gonna happen when Al Pacino and Robert De Niro die. I mean, these are the best two actors we have, you know. I mean, they're no good anymore, but who can make Godfather anymore? You know, I mean, these are iconic human beings, right? And so you have these, this, these couple of windows in life that something happens to you where you grow wings, you're inspired. You like walk on clouds. And you should cherish those moments because once those windows close, you're just a piece of meat walking the ground, going nowhere. 
you know. Is it true that Jim Jones was a charlatan? Maybe, I mean, I don't know. I didn't, didn't know him personally. Is it true that he told people to drink the Kool-Aid and die, commit suicide? Yeah. Were people inspired to do that? Yeah. They weren't depressed, they were inspired. And all of a sudden that thing inspired suicide, it makes a suicide very, very different than someone who's depressed and has nothing going on. Maybe? Yeah, weren't, weren't a lot of those people from the Bay Area? Yeah, how Bay Area people are. Anyone else? Diana? That's it? Yeah. I was wondering about Of course, of course. I was waiting. Go ahead. You don't like hard work, huh? I, do, I don't mind hard work, but... It's too much? It's long. I'm sorry. We're supposed to be Now, do the best you can. My recommendation, AI. <laughs> Chat GPT. Or pay someone to do it for you. All of a sudden, the writing is really good. <laughs> I can only say this stuff because, you know, I know that it usually takes a long, long time to be able to write well. So I'm in no rush to read your essay, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Follow-up question to that is... Hello. Oh. How are you? Good. I'm sorry to interrupt. What it's the last one in the parking lot. We're trying to see if we can move it over. It's the parking over here. Oh, do well, I need to do it? The class will be over in like five minutes. That's fine. Okay, I apologize. No, it's okay. 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 Right. Hurry up. Um, okay, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> all right, so it's, it's five essays within one assignment. The what? It, the, the final assignment, it's five essays within that one assignment. Um, is that worth more than the previous ones, or is it worth the same amount as the ones where it was just two videos or one video? They're all the same. Same value. Yeah. Anyone else? Before we... Nothing? Really? Milo? No one? Well, listen, I should go before they take my van. <laughs> um, my apologies, I was going to do the Ten Commandments because they're really fun. Yeah. So have a good evening. See you next week. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.